Balu. For everyone, he is someone who has embarked his journey in this development sector by living and working for several years among remote forest-based tribal communities in the south, southern Indian district of Mysuru. So he's someone who is widely respected in development as a development activist, leadership trainer, thinker, and a writer. Right after his MBBS, he earned his master's in philosophy in hospital administration and health and systems management from Bits Pilani. He is a master's in public administration from the Howard University. His living habits were greatly influenced by the teachings of Swami Vivekananda. And at the age of 19, he founded the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement based on the principle of Ahinsa, Satya, Seva, and Tyag. He has spent around the last 36 years of his life in the service of the rural and tribal poor in the forest of India. He is also the founder and chairman of Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, a public policy think tank in India. So Dr. Balu embodies a rare blend of grassroots and a micro perspectives and policy through his multifaceted experience of more than three decades now. He is currently a visiting professor at Cornell University USA and at IIT Delhi India, where he teaches teaches courses on leadership and human development. He also coaches and mentors senior leaders in the nonprofit, corporate, government, and educational sectors globally, apart from running leadership workshops for people from these sectors. And today we have one of his workshops definitely on the same topic. He has also authored several books in Canada and English. One of his latest books is Leadership Lessons from Daily Living which has been just released and we can know more about him and his books on his website that is www.drbalu.com i shall definitely paste the link for all of you to refer to that we welcome you dr balu as i said we are Thank glad you. and we are privileged to have you here today and i'm sure our teams have a lot to learn and take away from. what i'm going to share with you today is all maybe spin-offs of the different the four quotes that i heard till now so thank you again for inviting me and it's always a pleasure and a privilege to be amongst young people because I do believe uh, uh, and obviously coming from uh, the background of Swami Vivekananda and his message, the way he put it uh, and I always, uh, when I was young, I thought it was very audacious of Swami Vivekananda to said it. He said, give me a handful of young men and women and I will change this world. So I call it audacious because I thought that age, I thought, how can this man, just a handful of people, talk about changing the world? Changing India itself is so challenging. Changing our own little small neighborhood is so challenging. And then he also qualifies the kind of young men he wants. You know, he says nerves of iron and muscles of steel, and 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 then describes the kind of qualities that uh, that that group of young people should have. So today we live in a very very challenging time. I was looking back at my own life and uh, as I was trying to put together some thoughts. First clarification is obviously being online. I'm sorry, it can't be a workshop. Uh, it's a challenge and I would ask to be excused uh, for not being able to run it as a workshop. So I'll just be sharing thoughts. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, so it's not really something where we can work and shop together and learn. So it's going to be a few concepts I'm going to share and hopefully sometime we get an opportunity of physical, physically meeting and interacting with you, maybe half a day, some uh, interactive mercy workshop or something we can run. Now you're all in this because there's some spark in you, something in you. And uh, I know the structure of the workshop was mostly like I speak for 30, 40 minutes and then we share questions, but I don't think I'm going to stick to that. So I'm going to ask a very fundamental question and uh, I'm going to trouble Banu and Tantosh and everybody else to ma moderate how we are going to manage technology for technology for the answers. So I'm not going to trouble myself with that. Is why are you even wanting to be an entrepreneur? I know this question must have been asked a hundred times. My own son is at a phase in which he's trying out different entrepreneurial things that he wants to do in life. And, and that spark is so beautiful, so contagious, so joyous. And when I started my journey at 19, I was called a fool. And I'm talking 37 years ago, which is a long time ago, and throwing away the comfort of a, you know, being a university ranker in medicine, could have chosen the life I wanted. And people called me a fool without recognizing choosing the life I wanted is exactly what I was doing anyway. And so the metrics were different. Finally, many of us measure success by the end outcome without recognizing the real success is the journey itself, and especially in the journey of entrepreneurship. So I'm going to, uh, I want to really thank you for that. Uh, Again, the, uh, uh, a wonderful way of defining what I would start my lecture with is understanding purpose. 
and we, because without understanding purpose, I think the rest of rest of everything that we talk is just not going to really matter. So I'm going to just leave one thought out there. Uh, civilizational foundation, especially in the Indian context, because most of us in the Indian construct, unfortunately, think everything civilizational or everything scriptural is religious. Uh, without understanding that there's so many powerful ideas that for generations, for thousands of years have been tried, tested, and then collated together and put it into a particular format that we can understand. And since we have not been taught in that space, we generally tend to ignore the past without recognizing the lessons that we can learn. At the same time, not being conditioned to those thoughts. So I just would like to leave behind four civilizational powerful ideas brought together and as, an, as, a, as a nation, not in separation. And that's the beauty of the convergence that I would like to just throw the thought out there and then move on without de uh, delving too much into it. For a particular reason, if you look at it, four powerful concepts symbolized by definitions of their own, symbolized by actions that each of these concepts might require from our side, but essentially revolving around the fundamental structure of society and the functioning of society itself. And if I were to put those thoughts out there, Artha, Kama, Moksha, Dharma, four concepts, right? Artha is simply the incentive to run an economically operable system. And today you can never dissociate our existence, however much we might all try. Like in the course on development I teach, I talk about a completely new economic model, but still I have to talk of an economic model. You know, we may not say 8% GDP growth, we may not say $5 trillion economy, but an economy is an inseparable part of our life. Like this all finally. And economy itself would be fundamentally non-existent, but human element of desire. And desire not in a very negative construct. So the, we, we all tend to immediately give a value of uh, understanding of all these words. I, I would like all of you to be absolutely non-judgmental of these words for a moment. Don't, don't hold a positive or a negative connotation to any of these words. Just listen to those words and form an interpretation in your own minds from the, from the background in which I'm talking. The economy to even run, sustain and grow, it would be meaningless without our desires. And desires are not necessarily consumerist, not necessarily materialistic. The four of you today express four powerful desires. I would like to leave the world better, or I would like to change the world, or I would like not the future people who are visually challenged to go through the suffering I went through. Every element of the four of your expressions are desires. Now, do we desire it for ourselves or do we desire it for a larger cause is a completely different argument. And let's hold on to the thought. But without the desire, either personal or public, you cannot move the economy at all. And that's a fundamental uh, uh, civilizational foundational thought I would like to leave in your minds. The third, and the more important one for me, dharma not, you know, unfortunately, today's polarized world interprets things they way conveniently, whichever way people want. Dharma is simply a righteous way of living. And every religion talks about it. There's no religion which does not talk about a righteous way of living. You can have religion in this world. They all foundationally and fundamentally existed only to keep society straight and on righteous path. And they might incidentally say the righteous path is to live towards a God that they describe. Only when we hold on to our God, your God, my God, all the problems start. We have forgotten that we have to reach God, but we start labeling God to such an extent that we think our label is the only label. So that's the that's corruption of Dharma. But Dharma in a simple sense is just a righteous way of living. And today's talk is going to connect Dharma to the way we create our own karma, the desire, to the way we generate and sustain Artha, the economy. And incidentally, the last concept of bliss or moksha, or I would call it spiritual evolution that we all need to undergo and going to transcending this humanness to something more divine. So I'm going to leave this thought out for you and then connect all our, whatever we do in the entrepreneurial space. And some of us maybe might have already started your journeys with this connection without even defining it the way I defined it. You might have already formed it in a loose way in your minds and that would be a journey. But fundamentally, I would like to uh, place the next 30-40 minutes of my sharing some of my thoughts with you on the way I see all this. And everything I speak today will find some inspirational strength from some of these basic ideas. Now let me start off saying, if each of you were to look back 10 years, 20 years later and ask yourself, what is the what if I were to draw a matrix of what I would call a success to everything I did, 
in the entrepreneurial space i can pretty much challenge you you cannot derive an indicator of success beyond these four parameters i have to show, told you about in some way or the other every indicator of success if you were to draw a table and put all the elements you can box them in one of these four boxes so if what will success look like if i ask any of you and if i were to go back and ask shakul himself how would he see life as a success 5 years from today 10 years from today 15 years from today and it's a small thought experiment we can even try it out now for with nishita and shakul and if i were to ask you you already know your entrepreneurial journeys you already know what you think life's purpose for you is and if that is the definition of your beginning of your journey where would you be as a milestone 5 years from today 10 years from today and then looking back you would say well i traveled well i think i took in the path less traveled but still i've traveled a substantial journey of my life and this is what success means to me how would you how would you qualify your success and describe it this is directly to rishi and shakul Shakul, both of you processing it still, I know, but it's a very. I just thrown the question at you randomly. I would like you to think about it and just, if, if you want, you can just write down and and then come back to me later. But I'm I'm like I told you, I, I, I a very very uh, strong statement I made. It's very difficult to put measurement of success in, except in these four boxes. If you were to try it out, all of you to try out this experiment. in some way or the other they would be related to what fundamentally drives you. you you can call it passion but that's a drive and the drive is born out of an innate desire of doing something for society and like you know, I, somebody wants say, to go yeah shakul go ahead i would say like i don't know that where i would be like 5 10 years down the line but i'd like to see myself not giving up what i am trying to do even though i fail the 100 or billion times there's something that my passion the fire that i have in my belly if it is still alive like i think is 5 10 years down the line i would be the happiest person i would say and and would you would you would you to succeed would you take shortcuts shakul uh i don't think uh in my opinion i don't think there is a shortcut to success you've got to work really hard people who have been succeed successful they work their lives hard and Great. i wouldn't find a short shortcut for a successful okay so if you were to actually rearticulate it you would you would keep working till you know you to see the fire in your belly continue which means your karma is at full glow the desire to say, make the world come you know make it better for people uh, with vision like one of the very uh, famous and one of the great, uh, good cricketer indian captain virat kohli said the other day you know when i'll see that i am not giving my 100% on the field i'll stop playing for my country it's great. exactly like that when so i see that i'm not contributing i will stop giving 100% is a very strong desire that's wonderful yes Let's carry on so now in in this context when you all start off your journey you like to focus on one critical element and then look at you know how do you even measure success right the metric of success is going to be critical for some of you you might you might look at i'm not saying it's the same for everybody it's obviously going to be very different for different people and what i'm going to present today is i i work with a lot of young people around the world in several different countries i have uh, work with a lot of young people in the us uh, many of them my students in countries like panama in europe uh, till recently as advisor to the government of egypt so i used to work a lot of young people in egypt uh, obviously india uh, being a home country and there's so much of access to young people today with so much of energy and joy and some experiments that i have done uh, in some of the south asian countries and uh, some african countries i found and people are no different anywhere in the world it's so easy to work with them mainly because the power that drives them and the potential that is embedded in them is uniquely young it's a demographic rather than a geographic entity so it's no different whether it's latin america or europe or india or the us wherever you start working with these people i realize some and so i'm going to draw inspiration from some of the answers i have got from a lot of these people and i'm i'm hoping it will align with what you people also see as success so most of the people 
one thing they have seen is they're very, very strong and clear about the fact that they want to succeed, but it is never success at any cost. That's a commonality I've seen among people today. And that is why I think already in most of you is embedded a sense of correctness or rightness. Nobody would have taught you what is the shortcut. And when I say shortcut, it is uh, hard work, could, not working hard could be a shortcut for some. A parental ladder that you have could be a shortcut for somebody else. Breaking loss could be a shortcut for somebody else. Bribing your way to success could be a shortcut for somebody else. But most young people around the world have consistently and uniformly told me, I would like to realize the vision of what I've started out for. And that would be success to me. And if the vision is empowering, in Shakul's case, the visually challenged not to go through the problems they went through, or in, in, in the case of the agribus community about getting farmers to realize their entire potential, whatever you chose to do, realizing that vision, the needle moving in the direction of the realization of that vision is one element of success, but very clearly, not at any cost. You know, you're very, very clear that there's a righteous dimension to success, the dharma that I spoke about. And that to me is a very, very, uh, you know, very principled way of approaching success. The second, for most people I, I spoke to, it was not about the destination at all. But, but it was about the joy of the journey, like Akshay himself writes, you know, he said, he's written it so beautifully in the chat box. I'm into, I'm just quoting and reading what he wrote. And this is this kind of answers I've been getting around the world. And that's, that's why I'm always thrilled to see so much of consistency. And that's why I believe that there's a future for this planet. I am into entrepreneurship because the great journey, and these are all the similar words. If I were to run a word map, I can tell you these are all the words that are coming up and again and again, that we go through being one. You know, this, this, I did just look at the journey and being one, that, that powerful sense of oneness and helping us develop and expand our horizons. So the constant element of growth, learning, and then moving ahead. These are all the elements of success. And to me, I think for, if, for most of you, if you were to sit back, if this had been a workshop, I would have had all these kind of small little simulations and exercises. And if you were to make notes and ask yourself, okay, now that I've been asked this question, what will it look like for me five years from today, five months from today, 10 years from today, you will see a consistent pattern of all these conceptual elements of continuing the fire in your belly, continuing to what you do when you might evolve your purpose, you might expand your purpose, you may actually build and enrich your purpose, you may even alter your purpose, but the fact that you will have a purpose is going to be consistent. You may keep moving the goalpost in life, but the fact that you will always have a goalpost will be something which is consistent. And that having a goalpost to me is a success and not reaching the goalpost itself. And this is something you, I, I find it extremely powerful amongst all the people I worked and mentored with. And now let me look at the second element that I spoke about, not at any cost, which essentially means the means matter to you. End also matters. It's not that end does not matter. You really want to see the change that you want to bring about. But you want to see the change that you bring about on your terms and on righteous terms. And so embedded in your understanding of what is more important, the means being more important than the end, is a clear com moral compass that is sort of engineered in today's people that this is something which is not negotiable for me. And for those of you who have not thought about it, I would strongly urge you, entrepreneurship by itself is no fascinating journey. It's become a sexy, fashionable statement today. But I'll tell you, that is not the journey. But entrepreneurship in the way that we're talking about today, in the con construct of today, for some of you might not have possibly, you, you might have got so busy with doing what you're doing, you might have stopped, stopped to pause and ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? And if you ask that question, most likely you would get this answer, that the means matters. Now, the third completion in all this, as you start this journey, that, and I have found this, it's tremendously uh, puzzling and when young people come to me and then the dilemma that I, they face is not about the fact that they have, they're forced to do, enter into a compromising state or into, enter into an accommodation they dislike. It's the fact that their inability to even perceive something as ethical. Now that's something which is really strange to me because well, there's a tacit appreciation of the means being important. There's a tacit appreciation of I want to be righteous. There's a tacit appreciation of I don't want to succeed at any cost, but I want to succeed on my terms. But what happens is because of the, I find this very, very, uh, it's a complex thing. It's a multi-layered 
conceptual framework. But if you think about it deeply, it's simple. To me, what I found it puzzling when people come to me for uh, discussions or questions during the coaching or mentoring that I do, it mo and this is not just young people. And I have worked with uh, uh, lead, uh, political leaders for want of uh, the non-disclosure agreement several times. I can't name them. Corporate leaders, several in India and outside. The challenges are very similar it's because what happens is the society being so dynamic, society being driven by so many variables that are constantly expanding, even the definition of ethics is also altering rapidly. So what we think is ethical in a particular context and framework suddenly doesn't seem so ethical in some other context. What I thought was ethical 10 years ago and lived my life the way I lived. And today when I look back, it looks very unethical at this point of time. So we get caught in the moral dilemma. The moral dilemma is, did I do something wrong or am I doing something wrong at this time? Because the definition of right and wrong also doesn't seem to be consistent. And this is where I always believe the best barometer of measuring your success is going beyond the ethicality of your action and looking at the foundational driver called values. And what are the differences here? Ethics is a very social construct. Ethics is a construct which brings in social order and harmony to help society move on. And therefore, when society evolves, the fundamental appreciation of what is ethical has to be dynamic and alterable. Otherwise, society can't grow and move on. But whereas ethics brought this inspiration from very, very fundamental values. And these are the values you got to define for yourself today. And the expression of those values in your work as practices is what gets ethically interpreted. So it is not, what changes is not your values per se. It's like an onion. You peel the onion, the outer layer is the practices. But as you keep peeling out the different practices, which might alter, but when you go to the core, that core are the values that are going to drive you as a human being. That core are the values that are going to make, make essentially describe who you are and what you're doing for society. And that's something I would I like all of you Spend some time, and these are very deep questions I would like to, uh, you to think through. And I found this very useful of just writing it down and explaining to yourself, what does it mean to you? For many of you, this will be very, very fundamental human values. Now, I have had a very simple construct in my life. I have said that I live by five values. And four, I say, are explicit and stated. I tell the world these are the values I live by. The fifth I always say is unstated. And because of founding the organization also on those values, these are the values of my organization too. And I say I measure every person that I associate with, both in the internal ecosystem as well as in the eco external ecosystem by these values. There's a price to sticking to your values. If the, the price could be a lack of growth, price could be that you may get, uh, you, you may feel suffocated in certain circumstances. You might feel, uh, that you're losing the battle, you're losing the race. A lot of these questions come, and that is why I said define what success is. If success to me and the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement had been to be a nationally known organization, if success to me had to be the national recognition that such organizations would get or I would have gotten, then I'm a failure. But success to me is the fact that I gave a hundred percent to live my values. Even if it meant going to jail, I've been arrested, I've been beaten up. At 34, I turned on national awards. I don't want to name those awards because I felt they are going to be distractions to the journey that I've taken. But I still call my life a success. We work across the state of Karnataka. We could have worked across the state of India. But the fundamental values that I have subscribed to, I believe, are all Vedantic values, are very ancient human values. They're very humanistic. Any, any, anywhere in the world, these apply. For me, the way Gandhi described Ahimsa and um, Satya, and Vivekananda said the national ideals of Seva and Kyaga. So everything I have done, I say, should draw inspiration from these values. And to me, success would mean, am I giving a hundred percent to live up to these values? Success can never mean I'm leaving these values. It's a virtual impossibility in the construct of today's world to say, and I'll be lying to you if I were to say I lived my values the last 37 years. But I will be telling the hundred percent truth when I say, I give her my 100% to try to leave these values. And the fifth unseen value that I have said is, my life's work must be driven by an unspoken interconnected thread for giving meaning to these four values. These four are dry values. But what gives it meaning is what I say is Vishwa Prema or love for everything in this world. 
which is not divided or destroyed by religion, color, sex, gender, location, nothing. It is just an infinitely powerful interconnection of love that unites me to the rest of the world, which makes my other four values not dry and humanistic and gives an application value to that. I'm saying this as an example, not because I'm trying to follow those values. Each of you will have those kind of values. But if you're wanting to start your journey of enterprise without some fundamental appreciation of some deep value, it could be one, two, three, four, whatever you decide. And if you don't, if you're not to use that as a metric of measuring your lives, then I think you have to reevaluate why you're even doing what you're doing. So for those of you who are just doing it for the joy of the adventure, for the joy of the adrenaline that flows through you when you're working on everyday projects that you're doing, I think that is just one small component of why you're doing what you're doing. The deeper component is what I try to say there. The last I want to bring about is ask yourself, and I want to give a very pragmatic appreciation of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship for a lot of people has been, I've seen two spectrums. And, and this, uh, like I said, interacting with a lot of people, one end of the spectrum is a very uh, you know, powerful answer of, I want to make a couple of millions when I'm 20 or 21 or 22. And there's nothing wrong. Let me say the fundamental drive to acquire is very fundamental and all of us have it. What the acquisition could be the different, the, the, but the drive to acquire is something very neurobiological. I won't get into that right now. It needs a longer uh, session for me to explain that. But that being said, you cannot escape it. That has to be a driver for you, but there's something else, right? So if you cannot balance out these two elements in the entrepreneurship that you're doing, I would believe as a value concept itself, if you are not fundamentally wanting to look for combining and bringing about a fine balance between private gains and public good, then you're going to be soon frustrated in the journey that you started out for. Because if you're only looking at public good, and I can tell you my own life is an example of that. I never even thought of myself in this equation. I'm not saying you should think of yourself, but you may, you may call private gain as a satisfaction you get from doing good to others. The fact is I realized when I look back at my life, I was extremely satisfied with what I've done. I was extremely happy with the visibility, I, the name, fame, etc. And in a very selfish way, they were affirmations of the work I was doing. And that is private gain. Private gain doesn't have to be just money that we make. It doesn't have to be just the acquisitions of physical entities like salary, house, car, etc. It could also be the emotive acquisitions of visibility, name, fame. The very fact Banu wants me to share some of my thoughts with you is a visible acceptance of my thinking and ideas. And that makes me feel nice and good about it. When I advise countries or presidents or governments and the recognition that goes along with it is an affirmation that your thoughts and ideas are accepted. And that is a personal gain too. So the fact I'm trying to make is it's always a combination and it, the ones who have the courage to accept it are the ones who can be feel liberated enough to practice it also. So private gains with public good is a formula that is very practical. It is also a formula that is noble because you're thinking of public good. For some, the public good may be bigger than the private gains. For some others, private gains may be bigger than public good. So without standing in judgment of what is the right combination, I would like to ask all of you, to make sure if you want to be sustainable, if you want your idea to keep going on and on and on in perpetuity, even after your lifetime, if you want the enterprises that you start to have a life of its own, to truly be a going concern in the words of our accountants and lawyers and chartered accountants, then I think you should ask yourself, am I learned the formula for my, and it's very unique to your own organizations, to balance this private gain and public good. And if you can treat it as embedded value of your existence itself, then I think a lot of the, if you, and all of them go together, looking at means and end, looking at success the way I defined it, your ability to live your convictions throughout life, the journey being more important than the destination, and the balance of the very practical way of looking at private gains and public good. For all this, essentially, you need to understand leadership. And that is what is the beauty of this. As much as you need all the technical inputs that you need to survive as an entrepreneur. Now, if you are in the health space, you need to be an expert in that domain. You got to build competence in that space. There's no renegotiating that. There is no way. Either you do it or you get people to, with, the, with the capacity to join you. Or if you want to be in the agricultural space, you need to have domain knowledge and you have to build it. 
I'm not saying qualification. I don't think qualifications are relevant for your generation at all. I am with a strong belief that what you need is a skill set and a mindset, nothing more. You don't need degrees anymore. You don't have to go to Harvard like me or Banu and waste three, four years of your life. I believe those are all, they're all some amount of cosmetic additionalities you get. I'm sure I wouldn't be invited to countries as advisor if you didn't have the Harvard degree. But that's the reality of life. But that's important in one particular phase. But to succeed as an entrepreneur, I believe what you need is a perfect combination of skill sets and mindsets. And if you really want to understand leadership, right now I would like to limit my sharing with you to the mindset ideas. Because skill sets, you already know it. You're in the domain and uh, what, what uh, all Banu and friends are doing with all of you is to expose you to all these possible ideas in your own ways. I would like to stick to the mindset. And from in the mindset, I would like to stick to essentially how would I view leadership as a very powerful mindset approach of leadership. Okay. And in that particular way of thinking, to me, leadership is not about a position at all. It is not about having the authority to stand there and say, I'm the CEO of the company I started. I'm the founder of the company I started. I'm the co-founder of something. Or I'm this, I'm that, all these fancy titles the startup industry gives itself, right? It's all not that. Well, all that might be important from a symbolic framework, from an operational framework, from a framework where you have to transact in an environment that understands those terms. I would like to go a little deeper and something more fundamental in your thinking. The mindset I would like to have is interpret leadership, not at, as all that and the power and position that flows from your position or from your titles, but something that flows from the very essential core of your existence. What would I define it as then? I would define it in a very simplistic way as leadership being a process of understanding yourself. And if you try to invest your time and energy in understanding yourself, asking some very fundamental existential questions like who am I? What am I doing? Why am I even doing what I'm doing? Why am I not conforming? You know, well, we can sort of bravely say I'm not a conformist. Have you challenged yourself and say what is wrong with conforming? Why do we think not conforming is a great success? Why don't you see that being conforming and still not conforming could be a greater success? You know, I remember a quote of uh, Swami Ramakrishna when he said, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa says it so beautifully. And I think that is the balance I spoke about. He says, you got to be like the lotus leaf. You got to be in the water, but still not get wet by the water. And that's so powerful. We got to learn to transact in this world as we know it. We cannot create a new world for ourselves. We cannot create a world where non-conformity is a conformation. And then that also become conformation, right? So we got to live in a world where we understand how to stay a non-conformist at heart, but not allow the external conformation to affect us. And that's not easy. For that, you got to understand yourself and travel the journey of asking yourself these existential questions. Why am I even thinking entrepreneurship is better? Why am I even wanting to take these risks? What is my fundamental purpose? Where does my passion come from? What is that seed that is working to grow into a tree inside me? Because the moment you understand that, the power that you unleash, the dynamo that you switch on is something unbelievable, my friends. And I can tell you, even today, the more and more I try to go deep into myself, the more and more energy I get to say, and the only lament I have is, I'm running out of chronological age. I wish I was 30 years younger. So there could be so much more that I'll have physically capable of doing. And I'm sure that will be the kind of fire each of you will carry forth. So begin the journey of leadership by asking this fundamental question, am I understanding myself? Now, understanding yourself could help you frame the private gains that I spoke about. And like I said, private gain just means gains for myself. It's not about money. So don't, don't equate it to just traditional understanding of what private gains are. But there's this next part of the equation because the journey of leadership is incomplete with just understanding yourself. The next element and the three elements and all three are important. No, no, no one element is more important. I think it's, it's not a sequential thing I'm talking. They all happen together. The next element and the journey of entrepreneurial leadership to me is understanding others around me. Who are the people I interact with? What are the fundamental reason why I'm setting up this enterprise? If it is an agri-based business I'm setting up, who are the others for me? The farmers, the traders, whatever you decide. If Shakul sets up a learning opportunity enterprise for the visually challenged, the others are all those people, right? And unless you understand them, unless you walk in their shoes, 
unless you're able to appreciate understanding the self also means understanding that whether you have the compassion whether you have the empathy abilities to understand the others around you not from your perspective not from your experiential baggages not being limited by your experience but essentially using experience to inform you and not to influence you the day shakul feels that his personal experience goes beyond informing him and if it starts influencing him then he's lost the beauty of understanding others then you will start projecting your experience onto others and therefore your product is going to be limited by that understanding itself more and more you start understanding others both in a vyavaharic plane of business and a deeper emotional plane a much deeper spiritual plane your appreciation of the other as a part of a leadership toolkit that you have is not complete so understanding yourself is the first leg understanding the others around you in a parallel exercise is the next leg of this journey and the third and the most important part as you discover and unpack yourself as you discover and unpack the others around you the third most important question which is a fundamental question driving the fire of entrepreneurship in you guys is what are the actions that connect me that bind this self to the others around me until you figure out what are those actions that connect me to the self to the others around me you're not really discovered the enterprise that you want to be in you might think you found it out you might only discovered an activity but the relational connection between you the self and the others around you it is not going to be a passion driven exercise and to succeed i think the passion that one of you mentioned at the beginning is the fundamental oxygen for this whole work that you're going to do and so to me leadership journey my friends is begins with understanding yourself understanding others around you and understanding the actions that bind the self to the others around you and the more and more you start getting deeper into this and start figuring this out there is no way the way i define success in the beginning of this discussion that you could ever fail so how does it look like i'm not getting going to get into how do you reason morally how do you justify the actions that you do obviously that's a longer and a much more deeper space and i would i generally don't like to do that in an online space because i may not communicate it effectively so i'll quickly use the next 4 or 5 minutes to wind up what i'm saying and then let's have an interactive session and we'll try to unpack this a little more how have i seen what kind of qualities do i see in people who actually have the courage to try and go through this journey and i'm trying to map it and that is uh, my i've been doing this for the last decade now and unfortunately the joy of learning that i get so many young people is because the learning is never complete my book is not getting over at all there's so much new that i learn and i'm not funnily i've not completed the last chapter for the last 9 years i my my agent has lost faith in me she lives in new york and she says i don't even know whether you'll complete your book in this lifetime and i believe her question is right because the the dynamic change in the ecosystem is so much and that change demanding so much of a change in young people today is so much that the final word on this can never be said covid has altered life as we know it covid has demonstrated the vulnerability of mankind in one stroke it has shown us how inadequate we are how inadequate is the repository of skill sets that we have people thought skills can answer everything people thought science can answer everything people thought specialization can answer everything in one nine months time a nanoparticle sized virus has showed us how competence is irrelevant today but those who understood leadership as this self others and action realized the adaptive necessity of leadership itself realized the dynamic evolution of leadership every day basis realize that they will evolve as every circums new circumstance evolves and that is the those are the people actually if you look at the last 9 to 10 months are the ones who have truly been unaffected by the changes and still managed to thrive so if you if you were to deeply internalize what i say i can promise you with all the conviction of experience from my side that you will not just grow as a person as an organization you will actually thrive growing is different my friends thriving is very 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 different and the difference has to be experienced so now what to, what this kind of what is this person who's actually gone through this journey how will he look like and if we were to make a list and again like i said this is just a global list uh, that i have learned from a lot of young people i might be good in putting it together and presenting it to you i can clearly say i, I have no ownership of these concepts it belongs to the world that i operate in it belongs to the young people that i deal with 
So in a sense, it belongs to all of you. And if you were to write down, you would have possibly returned on the same word if you are asked to reflect on what you are doing. So I find five elements in a very operational level. So I'm going to share that and then wind up my talk and then open it up to questions. Is that okay, Bano? Okay. So now how does it look like? I find most of these people are essentially great role modelers. So when the self evolves, automatically they become without their own knowledge, without their intent even, without their desire to be that, they become powerful influences of change. Not that they started the journey to influence or change anybody, but they become that. And this role modeling effect becomes a very critical element because you cannot grow an organization to reach levels of thriving without the team around you growing the same value mindset. And the best way to get your values to become contagious is to live it with the courage of conviction that it demands, which means you become a role model. And this happens. You, you sort of very seamlessly flower out your ideas and it goes like a small gentle wave in your organization. And that is what leadership should mean. In a real sense. And the next element I found is others for these people are not limited to in a very narrow framework of the people that transact their business world life in. It is not about your vendors, clients, investors, VCs, etc. It is something far bigger. And I can break it up into four fundamental elements. And all four are important, my friends. And if you forget this, even if one element is not kept in balance, the remaining three. The ratios may be different for each one of you. The proportionality of the four elements might be different. But the fact that you have to pay attention to all the four elements. The first, I would define it as people you associate in your workspace, the way in the enterprise world that you're operating in. And all that I spoke, all the values, all that, and the role modeling effect has to be in all the four domains. Don't think it's only in the workspace. The first domain, the workspace, I would define it as people who are in some way engaged the, the other, the, I'm dividing the others into four now, so you can understand what I'm doing. The other, I would, the first definition of the other is people associated with you in a very commercially related transactional relationship, where either you're earning money because of them or you're enabling them to earn money because of you. So there is a commerciality and which is important, the karma, the artha part of it, which is connecting this world to that. And so that is important for you to appreciate that you deal and how you lead your life in the understanding of self, others and the actions that you need to do in this space in a righteous way will help you to succeed in business. And that's an easy thing everybody understands because, you know, built to last, Jim Collins work, everything is very clearly demonstrable that ethics and business righteousness is what allows you to last forever. But I want, don't want you to stop there. And the next part of it is family. Those whom you are biologically connected to, deeply invested emotionally with. It could be your parents, your brother, sister, your husband, wife, children, whatever. Remember, they matter too. I have seen a lot of young entrepreneurs so absorbed in their work that they so they give themselves hundred percent to their work. They forget that that hundred percent of life is a larger societal construct in which you operate. Your hundred percent doesn't mean just you and your job. And I find after a few years, they're completely burnt out. So what use is your entrepreneurial abilities? What use is your enterprise? If you forget that people around you, people who have invested in you emotionally for tens of years, do not feel the joy and the love of being with you. And that's something very precious, my friends. Never ever forget that that small little world where they're not related to you as somebody who benefits from you transactionally in the commercial space, also matter. The quality time that you spend with all this and quality time is so different and enabled today with technology, right? You have uh, WhatsApp and Zoom and all that. There's so many ways. My mother lives in the US. Unfailingly, I have to spend an hour at least every week, whichever part of the world I am. I may, I cannot simply give an excuse. I'm so busy and I have a meeting at 11 a.m., 10 a.m., you're 16 hours ahead, you're 12 hours ahead. All those are nice excuses the mind wants to tell you to justify your inaction. But can't we now, real success to me is not to keep giving reasons for our failures in doing the small tasks. Real success to me is discovering reasons to succeed, not finding excuses to justify our failures. And family matters, my friend. Investing on that other called family is also part of your entrepreneurial growth. The third, and this is also so critical and we don't, we take it very lightly. Because that's what keeps the fabric of society going. 
and remember society is not there there is no business for you to even exist and that is the what i call community so if one part of the other is the professional workspace related people other part of the other is family in whom you are biologically and emotionally invested the third part are people who you may not connected with in a work relationship whom you are not connected biologically or emotionally in the sense the way families are emotionally connected but you are connected as friends people you go to movies for people you go to yoga for people you take a walk with or go watch a concert together people who are not connected in these two spaces but part of the larger community construct and this can be expanded to people whom you are completely unconnected to maybe the child in a slum maybe the little farmer who is uh, struggling to make ends meet in some part of the country or maybe that little person who is drinking water need or not met in some strange way who is an embedded part of society but society has not paid attention to him can you embrace that set of people as your community and you embrace to the extent that your bandwidth allows it's not as though everybody in this world has to be your uh, community but can you define a community as the other for whom you will also live and exist the other who's not connected in your business relationship the other who's not connected in your personal family relationship but define them as other and give yourself in a very un you know in a very non conditional non judgmental completely non transactional way to the other and the moment you do that you will find a new meaning of leadership itself and that will keep your energy levels going to actually do your work but sakti of research my friends these are all things i'm not just talking out of the hat this deep research to justify everything i'm talking and these are very powerful messages very simplistically drawn for the four dimensions of artha kama moksha and dharma that is spoken now the last and the one which we always sacrifice the one which we pay the least attention to is our self we think you know at the age that you are in you think oh i can face anything in this world but when i say self i'm talking about it again in four dimensions the physical dimension take care of yourselves in a physically appropriate way this is a temple you have been given the body is a very powerful instrument that's been lent to you till it dies and falls away treat it with respect it deserves give it the right input of food give it the right amount of sleep the right amount of exercise take care of it the way it should take care because if you don't use that instrument properly how can you even succeed in your enterprise and we ignore all this no we either don't eat properly when you're working hard or be smoking cigarette after cigarette or drowning all our evening problems in the biscuit that we want to drink i'm not saying all those are bad i have no value judgments at all i'm only saying respect to your body give it the respect and it will start paying back to you unfailingly have a calendar which can work for you whether it's meditation whether it's pranayama whether it's exercise whether it is swimming whether it is walking whatever it is that you think is important whether it's expanding your skill sets your knowledge base all that matters so body the next is the mind cognitive growth never ever forget today's world is so dynamic if you don't catch up one day you are actually lost out every day is a new learning exercise i have already learned so much in the last one hour with you people the first 4 minutes of what you all shared is for me enough of processing for the next 10 15 days there's so much depth in what you said you may not recognize it and you may just treat it as casual statement but if you pay attention to what you said and go back and reflect on it or listen i always ask for recording of my sessions not because i want to listen to my own voice but there's so much i could pick up from that because there's so much that you will learn from that so cognitive growth on physical growth cognitive growth emotional growth the more and more you bond with the other especially the unconnected unknown other the community i spoke about your emotions flower out you suddenly understand love is so universal it is so so non transactional because we live in a world where the husband has to tell his wife i love you the boyfriend has to tell his girlfriend i love you we have to keep telling it every day to make sure that they are loving us and if they don't tell us back in return i love you too then we think something is wrong which means there's a conditional acceptance of the transaction there i tell you something you give me something but true love is when you go to a slum unseen unspoken unheard nobody notices you your photos don't come in the papers and you teach mathematics to a little kid out there nothing to do with your social enterprise just that believe that the other should do as well as you and you give of yourself with no expectation not even an expectation of a recognition from anybody that is the way to grow and emotionally evolve and if you do through these three to perfectly well 
and if you follow the mantra of leadership i told you the fourth dimension of your spirit will evolve your soul will become so soulful and it's so so beautiful and by doing this my friends i find what would you become if i were to watch you 5 years later 10 years later i can easily tell that you're living this message that i'm sharing with you there are two ways i can tell one if i had to just scan your brain if i were to run a fmri of your brain and if i see the prefrontal cortex fully lit up i know you have lived this journey so it's a very easy way of doing it very evidential way of doing it but all of us can't have fmris done there are only two fmri machines in india so where do you do it from what is the other way of doing it there are eight qualities you will start manifesting and all of these eight qualities are so important to your success so measure your life now in how well these eight qualities are manifesting not whether your enterprise succeeded or not the first quality you will see is you become extremely compassionate compassion is not feeling sympathy for the other or empathy for the other compassionate is you know what passionate action done for making the other's life better the action that i said that connecting the self to the other is driven by the passion that some of you shared in the beginning of the conversation second is faith and hope you will have enormous faith in yourself that you as a person can actually bring about the change that you want to bring about the fire in the belly that shakul said even after 5 years or 10 years i should have that is what is the faith that you need to have and hope by that having that fire you will actually make a change in this world the world will be a better place for what i am doing and not simply the you know we always like to complain and say what is not there but you will suddenly realize you are no longer in that space you are always looking at what is there the third power is what i call the power of positivism you will stop seeing negativity around you will become a positive emotional activator this research from case western which shows how this actually you know how you engage with people as, as you become positive emotional activator the fourth is spirit of service you know help is very transactional i drop my pen somebody picks it up and gives it to me is a help in help there is a embedded understanding of reciprocity in help there is an embedded appreciation that i'll be thanked for helping somebody but service is done with the spirit of celebrating the divinity in the other recognizing the oneness in the other that akshay wrote about that feeling of oneness and in so it's a puja to the other that beautiful spirit of saying just that i celebrate the divinity in you no expectation in return that is seva that is service and you'll start seeing that you'll be doing it more and more and that itself has got a lot of material benefits in your leadership in everyday world as it is assessed the next is sense of humor you will suddenly become very joyful and laugh a lot you know today we think laughing itself you know in classrooms if children laugh they hey, buy much kai cut that kind of a situation shut your mouth hold your hands together but i'll think we'll all learn to laugh and we'll realize we're not la- no longer laughing at people the difference is we'll start laughing with people that's a major difference my friend that's a great way of spreading cheer and goodness in this world then you will you will start becoming the next element is what we call fearlessness fearlessness is not courage fearlessness is not enhancing your risk appetite fearless all that will happen they are all manifestations fearlessness not it's not the adventure spirit you have fearlessness is your ability to transcend the very understanding of fear itself and that's a such a critical element of enterprise and by going on this journey you'll start unpacking all this so beautifully so i think i finished five or six there are two more left next is called self enquiry constantly questioning yourself real spirituality is not going to the himalaya sitting in a cave and meditating real spirituality is practicing the journey of self enquiry one single question that bhagwan ramana maharishi said who am i just thinking of the question who am i am i banu am i shakul what am i doing why am i here why am i even in this workshop together why am i even sitting here for the last two hours simple existential questions constant self doubt about his existential issues you will start having this and you will start showing all this without even being able to see it and the last and the most important quality you will start manifesting is mindfulness enormously mindful of all the qualities i described enormously mindful of your sense of self heightened self awareness heightened awareness of the other heightened awareness of the interconnection between yourself and the other and that is what all the enable things that will succeed to conclude if you were to draw a matrix and ask okay all this is conceptually nice but tell me what do i do operationally how do i take a report card and make a report card what you need and you will find out five six qualities i have recognized so again like these are just qualities i picked up from talking to people and understanding and looking at their success like i said this is all part of the book which is yet to come hopefully it will come when i'm still alive 
the first quality you see is fairness. You'll start dealing everything you do in the transactional space with fairness. That is how your sense of satya will manifest. You'll be fair to everybody, to yourself and to others around you in all the actions that you do. You'll start seeing this heightened sense of integrity that you manifest. Integrity at a very core level, not at a transactional level, because the law wants you to be in a particular way. You don't care about the law anymore because your fundamental dharma itself is driven by integrity and fairness. The third, you'll have a very enormous sense of responsibility and accountability to whatever you do. The responsibility towards your product or performance, goods or service you deliver, or the public goods that you want to create, or accountability for the quality that you have to embed into your thinking, you will be that. Your entire workspace will be driven by mutual respect. You will never see somebody as an as a employee or somebody hierarchically inferior to you. You will see everybody as a critical component of the fascinating temple of enterprise you are going to build. And that is so important. That mutual respect becomes a part of you. It becomes your DNA. It will become DNA of your colleagues. It will become DNA of your enterprise itself. And you will see the last, the fifth one that I record is a continuous commitment to improvement. Call it Kaya, what that Japanese way of calling it uh, Kaizen, right? And whatever they call it, continuous improvement to improvement and to the concept of teamwork because the other becomes so embedded in your consciousness itself. And this all comes together. All the five qualities transactionally you'll start seeing. If the other eight qualities I said are in the self, the way the actions manifest with the others, these five things will start manifesting. And there is no way I can promise you, your life will be a failure. Because we'll have, we then we'll all be, you know, it's such a powerful, one non-stop celebration of success. It is no milestone. It is a success. And that is the real joy of enterprise itself. It is not your product, not your goods, not your service. But a life lived in this reflective immersion that I spoke about, that is going to define success for you. So thank you all. You know, going through what you were talking about, I had this question that, you know, for a leader, many a times it happens that he has to choose between one. Maybe looking at the, uh, you know, major mission of what he's doing or looking at the goal or looking at the greater good. Sometimes it happens that he cannot attain both. He either has to look at achieving the mission or looking at the greater good of what he's doing. So in such a situation or in such dilemmas, I would say, how should a leader decide what is more important and what is more correct? Because it may happen sometimes that, you know, what you're wanting to do is doing uh, a greater good, but maybe not helping you achieve what you wanted to. Or maybe if you're trying to achieve something, it is still making some of your team members or some of the other people suffer a little. So how do you decide in this dilemma what is the correct and right way of moving? Ahead? It's a great question, but it's actually a very practical question. And uh, several, t I think every one of us is going to go through, go through this repeatedly. You know, I keep telling this to uh, myself and also to people around me. The responsibility of leadership is the fact that we need to be part of the decision making system. We cannot escape this. That's why I said you no know, responsibility and accountability. The moment you hold yourself accountable to your decisions, then you're worried because you can't make, you can't afford, don't want to afford to go wrong. If you're responsible, you want to make sure that exactly what you said. So we all go through this dilemma. And how I dealt with it is all I can answer honestly. I don't think there's a magic bullet to this. Now, the way I look at it is I ask myself, what do I value the most at this point of time? If I think valuing the greater good is more important, I decide because I know it might change a little later. But we have to understand two things. I ask myself, is this decision I'm taking contextually relevant? Is it culturally appropriate? The next I ask is, what is a fundamental philosophical driver of my thinking? Is it egalitarian interest? Is it a utilitarian interest? Is it, is it fairness? Is it equity? Is it justice? Obviously, mm -hmm. you cannot have an answer which will tick all the boxes. But okay. a substantial number of these boxes are ticked. And I'm not left feeling uneasy after the box are ticked. I have to take a call, right? And once I take the call, I say, at this moment of time, I believe this is the right decision. I will never say this is always the right decision. And I tell myself, at this moment of time, this seems to be the right decision. And I go with it. Let me tell you one more fact. Whatever you decide, there are going to be consequences. Okay. Not deciding is also a consequence. Sometimes inaction is also an action. In some situations, I don't even decide. And I find that that decision is also the right decision. Not deciding is also a decision. But everything has got a price. And I ask myself, if the price is the price of the values that I'm carrying in my heart, if the price is the sacrifice that I need to do of my values, I will not do this, even if I ticked all the boxes. So the last question is the value question I ask. 
And if it is a compromising on that, then I say, no, that is too much of a price to pay and I'm not going to pay it. Everyone, that's why I said, everyone has to define and discern for ourselves, what is our value position? And once you base your entire existence on that foundation of what you define as your value, you don't have to imitate anybody else's values. They are yours and yours alone. And then life becomes easily mappable. Otherwise you get lost. Um, okay. Shakul's question is how to carry out yourself in one of the most difficult or strange situation. Something you think is very difficult for you. So basically, if anyone is in a situation which is difficult for them, how to carry out or conduct one? Again, like I said, again, pardon me if all my answers seem experiential from my own experience, because I think that is all is authority I have. Uh, it's unfair for me to say this could be an answer for your problem. You have to figure out your own answers. That's how life's journey is all about. But I can tell you how I figured out my answer. You know, when you look at your own difficulty, you ask yourself, is there a, can there be a more difficult circumstance that I haven't come across in my life? So I'll, I'll give a small narrative of a story. I, I've, I've narrated this in one of my books. I think it is in the, in the book I wrote called Voices from the Grassroots. The first chapter I call is the voice that keeps me going. Okay, I the moment I hit a problem, like, like I said, I've been beaten with slippers by my own tribal communities. I've been arrested. Okay, nonsense happens in life, right? But then I ask myself, is my problem that I'm facing now bigger than the problem that this person faced at that moment of time? And I'll tell you, I went through that crisis. It was 1987 December. It is so painfully etched in my memory. It's very difficult anecdote for me to narrate. I wrote that anecdote after 30 years of the experience. It took such a long time for me to come to terms with that experience. I was a young physician who went into the tribal community thinking I'll bring about magic change. I'll be the next Albert Schweitzer. The Nobel Prize is going to be waiting for me. And I found no tribal is interested in my presence at all, leave alone using me as a doctor. And these are the days when they were in the forest. And one particular, I suddenly heard that one particular person was pregnant. I was thrilled. I loved obstetrics. I thought, oh, I can all go deliver this person and then I'll be the hero of the community. They'll accept me as a doctor. Tomorrow I'll be invaluable to these people. And she was a daughter of the chieftain. So all double bonus. They deliver the chieftain's daughter, your life is made here. I went there, I realized painfully it was a 14-year-old girl who was pregnant. And in that instant of time, very, very embarrassingly, I never felt sad. I actually felt happy. I thought, oh my God, if I can deliver this 14-year-old child, which is high-risk pregnancy in medical terms, I'll really be the hero. Great opportunity God has presented me with. And I'd already planned how am I going to deliver and all that. And I checked on her. She was what we call early labor. It takes 24 hours for labor to fully develop, you know, especially in the first pregnancy. So I thought, let me come back tomorrow morning. I came back and next morning I was going. It was It's a Project Tiger area. Remember that. You always are wondering whether an elephant is going to trample you or a tiger is going to make you into breakfast, whatever. As I was walking, a woman told me, Puttama told me, where are you going so early? She was at the borewell pumping out water. I said, I'm going to deliver Madi. She said, oh, she laughed and said, oh, you don't have to go. The child was born last night itself. So I was devastated. One chance I had to prove I'm a doctor and this damn baby couldn't follow the textbook and simply comes off ugly. Now I lost the chance. I thought I must go there and do something. I must show I'm a doctor, right? The affirmations we seek in life. And at that time, I had not even understood myself. All these are experiences that I packaged on later in life. When I went to the Madi's house, I still remember Sani Madana Hadi was the name of the colony. The father Sani Madaya had gone to fetch fire, oil, water. And I know that the girl, 14-year-old child has delivered. I can hear her inside the house. I know she's living in the hut. It's a small 10 by 10 hut. I'm standing at the door and saying, come on, Madi, come and show me your child. She's refusing to come. I thought, let me put some eye drops in the eyes and put some umbilical, uh, clean umbilical stump and put some antiseptic there. She refused to come. Five minutes, she refused to come. She's not talking back. Imagine talking to a wall with no response from the other side. Five, ten minutes, something happened. Fifteen minutes, I got angry. I said, if you don't come out with the baby, I'm going to come into your house and see it anyway. Then she screamed out, burst. You know, she bursted out and said, please, please don't come inside my house. I have nothing to cover myself with. This 14-year-old, 40 years after so-called Indian independence, had delivered her own baby in the middle of the night. And while delivering the placenta, had soiled the only sari she was having. And when the soil got dirt, sari got dirty, she had washed it in the middle of the night after delivering her own baby, put it on top of the hut, was waiting for the sun to come out and dry that sari to cover herself again. What problem we could have that can be bigger than the problem of March 14? So I tell myself when I face a difficulty, what problem is so big that I should run away from it? Madi has faced this problem so bravely 
at 14 years of age. Can't I face this problem with all the tools and techniques I have with the Harvard education, with the visibility and uh, name across the country, I can face it more easily. So I keep telling myself every time I feel down, dejected, depressed, I tell if Madi can be so brave, so can I. That child of Madi grew up, became, studied in my school, became a young woman. She delivered a baby in my hospital. My wife is a gynecologist. She delivered the baby. And today, that baby is also nearly going into college. So when you look back and you see that confident, courageous Madi could face life at that age, what the consequences are of that. I am just an instrument in the middle. What are the problems can we have that can make it bigger? That's the way I look at life, Shakul. I guess what an amazing example, sir. Um, I guess every time now anyone is facing any problem, the first thing that can come to their mind is if Madi can do it, I can do it too. So I hope everyone remembers this every time they face any problem. Moving to next question from one of our own innovation coaches, Samir. He says, we are so taken in by every day's routine of transactional activities. When do we pause? Is there a good time to do so? And on the opposite side of the spectrum, paralysis by analysis, when you end up thinking so much that you don't end up uh, doing anything, should be a balance of both, will be considered a diplomatic answer. Okay, so how do we help this? I, I, I don't think a balance of both is the right answer. Again, uh, what, what I recommend, and this has been psychologically tested out, this is a very psychometric tool most of us in the world of coaching use. Is a simplistic. What we realize is the prefrontal cortex today, which is considered the executive uh, decision-making part of the brain. Neurobiology shows us that it, the highest synaptic connections, where the fibers coming from the basal part, the emotive part of the brain, and the cerebral part of the brain, which means a combination of emotions and reasoning, the fibers converge in this prefrontal cortex. So biologically itself, man has been built to balance emotion and reason. We don't see it that way. We think either from the heart or the head. I think it's always a combination. One might seem to be more bigger than the other. I'm saying this because that's the way we are wired. Now, how do you exploit the power and potential of the prefrontal cortex? And what are the tools both neurobiologists and psychologists together have shaped? The reality is the problem with most of our decision making is when you're weighed down by the consequence of your decision, the space of two emotions, one emotion is guilt and other emotion is fear. That is where the paralysis, etc. comes in. When you're taken a decision in the past and you allow experience to influence you and that past decision was wrong and you're living with the guilt of that mistake, you, are, you always tend to avoid the emotion of guilt rather than actually evaluate the situation objectively. Or... If you're worried about what the decision you take today is going to leave as a consequence in the future, in a simple way, if you're, if you're thinking decision making, everything is decided by an action which has got a consequence in the past or a consequence in the future, either driven by the guilt arising out of your actions in the past or fear that arise from the decisions you might take in the future, you're going to get paralyzed. Living in the present is the only way to take decisions, which means giving it 100% means living in the present. You don't have space to go either side. How do you do that? How do you promote it as a simple toolkit? One of the simplest tools that we recommend, and this is a constant lifelong exercise. It's not an exercise you do and you'll reach that point. There's no destination here. To stop this exercise, the brain is very powerful. Today, we have something called the plasticity of the brain. The brain will go back to its original shape very fast. It takes eight weeks to see the results of what I'm talking. Because that's all, how long it takes the brain to actually shape itself. But you stop, it will simply go back. So what do you do? do? When you go to bed, try this exercise. Try looking at your life from morning to night as a simple movie. I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I just went, had coffee, I went for a walk. You'll suddenly realize your whole 28, 16, 18 hours of your wakeful existence. You can actually think through in three, four minutes. You'll imagine as though it's going to take too long a time. Go to bed. The first thing you do before you fall asleep is to relook your, at your life the whole day. You will 99% fall asleep even if you cross breakfast. That's okay. But look at it without judging yourself. Don't say right, wrong. Oh shit, I got angry. I shouted at my wife. Oh, I shouldn't have told my son this. That is judgmental. You look only at data points and say, I shouted at my son. Stop there. The brain will love to interpret and say, oh no, I, I shouldn't. And then you'll also interpret and say, I, oh, Dr. Balu said, don't judge. I was judging all the time. I'm not even capable of doing this. You'll tell yourself all these stories. Keep watching yourself 
over time, over three to four weeks, you will suddenly reach a state where you are not judging at all. So don't feel bad if you are judging. That's okay. Begin with that, but don't stop the exercise. Continue to do this. You will find two, three minutes at all it takes for you to live the whole day's life. The, 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 what I am trying to suggest is the subconscious driven by the prefrontal cortex knows simply what is the right approach, what is good, what should be done. The, the conscious is what is weighed down by the consequence, guilt, fear, etc., past, the future and all that. So merging the subconscious and the conscious is what is this exercise. The more and more you become a, go to the balcony and watch yourself as an observer. The more and more you watch all that you're doing, the space of non-judgmental appreciation of what happened as mere data points and not as interpretations of the data that you're acquiring, you'll start reaching a level where you can actually do this. Don't take my word for it. Don't believe a word of what I said. Try it out with the discipline it requires for eight continuous weeks, not failing even one day. You miss one day, you lost it. You'll start again eight weeks from that day. After eight weeks, the results of what I told right now will be so powerful, you will not stop doing this. I can tell you, I started this exercise 30 years ago. It has stood by me completely and I can tell you every word works. If you want to reduce the gap between what you want, like Banu's explanation that he gave, what others think I am and all that. If you really want to become what you're capable of becoming, what you should truly become, reduce the gap between the conscious and the subconscious. Practice this, you will just flower out into that. Uh, so, uh, so you talked a lot about the values and how uh, the importance of values and how values drive yourself. So, uh, on that con in that context, how to develop a value for an individual if he he or she is just starting the journey or it is just an evolving process? You know, we we uh, power of reflection is underrated. The capacity to reflect is never part a part of our education system. It's a very sad state of affairs because most of you are trained how to be good engineers, how to be good whatever technologies, etc. But we are never really teaching people how do you spend time to pause and reflect? How do you go to the balcony and watch your life? How do you take the helicopter view? Now that's a practice we can all do. There are different tools to it. Uh, when I run a workshop or when I teach my courses, in all my courses, I make students reflect. That's part of the, you know, once you attach it to the academic process, they all do a good job of reflection also. After some time that becomes integral to life, it becomes practice. So I would suggest, I, I, I don't believe that you don't have values or you don't understand your values. You just not spend time thinking about those values. You're not spend time articulating them the way you know it. I would say take a pen. Every evening sit back and look at your life and look at all that you did. And just lock them down, log it down and say, how did you decide in a particular situation, right? This situation came up. I was talking to a client. I was talking to a venture capitalist. He said, if you do this, I'll give you a million dollars. But I knew that doing that was wrong. So I had the courage to tell him I'm not going to do it. I lost a million dollars. Maybe you look like a fool. Maybe your partner shouts at you. But you lock it down. You see patterns in your life after some time. Suddenly you will realize you're already leaving your values in some strange way. Then make a, give a word to it and say, this is what helped me. There's a price to it, but I enjoyed living that. Or if you're not enjoying living that, question that. It's not my value. The peace and the, 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 the joy that you get, some sort of an indescribable inner calm that you get by believing in what you believe and living it and having the courage of conviction in that belief is that indicates to you that is your value. Instead of borrowing values, there are two ways. Either you borrow values and force your life, the discipline and trigger to live it, have the determination to live it. That's the approach I took. I just took values from Gandhi and Vivekananda and said, I'm going to live this. And I interpreted my way and that's one way of doing it. The other way I actually recommend for any people is because it's very difficult for people like you and I'm, being, I'm not being judgmental, I'm just saying age as a people like you. You don't like to be boxed or conditioned into a particular behavioral pattern by somebody other than yourself. That is your generation today. My generation, I could tell myself, these are the values I lived and I was comfortable with it. But your generation, I say, discover your values. And this is the method I tell them people. Put it down and see if you're comfortable with it. Just start living it. And that is your life's compass. Sure, sir. Uh, we'll take a note of this, definitely. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We have two more questions for you. We have five minutes. So I'll okay. take the liberty of taking these questions too. So uh, it is by Santoshi who is asking, what do you think is more important? Being fair, kind or just? I think each one is so inseparable from the other. <laughs> if you start being fair, automatically kindness and just, justice is embedded in it. 
it may look yeah. like you're not kind when you're when you're fair and just sometimes it looks like you're not kind to a few people in the equation it looks like that but i can tell you in absolute sense sometimes not looking kind is also actually kindness to the other sometimes feeling that it's not fair to correct somebody in a particular situation might not look fair in that situation but it may look unkind when you correct it but correcting it is the greatest kindness you're showing that person being emotionally honest with everybody around us is the greatest act of kindness you can show but it look unkind many times so i think you cannot really separate these three though for english you know semantic sake we separate but this is such seamless interconnection of expressions of our way of looking at life itself that i believe that you cannot really say personal view on it and i completely agree this first a perspective we never thought of sir to be honest thank you for that thank so you. we have one more question from jenny was asking uh, that you mentioned that it was great to it was always great to always know more and more although the more we know the more our mind evaluates and that's how we form more opinions right now how do we make sure that our opinions or knowledge does not makes us biased or stop us from learning or openly listening to something new no i i don't that prop that's a, that is conditional learning that is a problem with learning itself we think that everything we listen to has to become no it's not that way information is today especially millions and millions of bytes of information are thrown at us from all sides we have to listen to the information give it the respect it deserves process it and look at what is relevant to us in the context in which we operate in the cultural i told you the con contextual relevance and cultural appropriateness and then decide what part of the information i want to retain and process there's something called in the brain and let me tell you there's a biological process which is acronym acronym is vsr the brain thrives on variety if i just give you monotonous information information which you already know the brain will reject it if i give you information which is so overwhelmingly large it will reject it also so i must give you information to the ability to which your brain can accept it it seeks variety but it cannot be overwhelmed nor can it be given very little so you also are going to be thrown information you will not be able to absorb everything your brain will only absorb selectively and that's an x s s is for select it selects it it selects it based on the filters you have it will select it based on the need of the you information that you want to use it for some reason you'll be connected somebody will remember all the cricket match scores of the last 10 uh, years of test series india played i cannot even remember yesterday's score actually i know india won but i don't you know how much they won by whatever i know that it is a waste of money for people who paid for 5 days 3 days is gone my son can remember every single dialogue he watches in all the tv shows he's watched till now he immediately said this actress that lady this person that man said this i can't even remember the show i watched yesterday so the brain selectively uh, the next is retains now we are seeing that it only retain what it has selected from the variety it has presented to based on how it applies it if you don't apply the information selected within 180 days of selecting it chances are you will forget it so we are never going to be so you are constantly processing and evaluating and you are forming opinions but the moment you become more and more observant of yourself you will know that those opinions are conditioning you to do it in particular ways i am not saying you never get conditioned that is how you build your default settings in life that is how you all build your actions to particular situations we are all the time listening observing we are all the time interpreting interventions lead to, uh, interpretations lead to interventions but leadership when it's intervening if you are aware that my interpretations might be incomplete my description of reality may be based on my experience that is knowledge and that is the wisdom you need to acquire so information becoming knowledge when it is applied becomes wisdom when you know the fallibility of the knowledge in that you have and that is the journey each of you have to undertake so your brain is very powerful don't underestimate it it is constantly processing filtering out if you start doing the practice i said of reflection and reobserving yourself without judgment you will start seeing patterns and then you will use a pattern which is appropriate for the situation it's a, con a very complex concept i explained i tried to explain it as simplistically as i can but it needs a physical space a board a drawing a exercise for me to demonstrate it no i guess with the limitations of being virtually present i guess this was an amazing way of telling us what is the best thing to do for us uh, sir if you don't mind i'll take the liberty of taking this one last question from the team you can you can have the liberty of asking the question <laughs> i reserve the liberty of answering it 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we'll take this last one. Normally, leaders tend to take up front and center while steering the organization. How does one slow down and engage in such a way to get everyone involved, heard, and most importantly, invested in the ultimate way forward? I have a very simple answer. Leadership is not about you at the center. Leadership is always about the work at the center. You should not be asking yourself, what can I do in the situation? Ask the question, what does the situation need? That, what is that the situation needs to be done? What needs to be done in the situation is an important question, not what should I be doing in the situation? The more and more you keep asking yourself, what needs to be done now helps build mm -hmm. a team, eliminates your ego. It takes a lot of problems out of the equation. More and more you think I am the CEO, I should be doing this, I should be having answer to every question. The more you destroy groups, the less you think of yourself, and the more you think of the work that needs to be done, automatically things will happen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. Much. Yes. <laughs>